Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise God. We greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. There is none like him and there is none to be compared to him. The Bible says from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the very same, the name of our God is to be praised. I happy that we are again in another Bible study session and I pray God that tonight's session that we will learn much from the word of God. Amen. For the past few weeks, Bishop Daly was doing the topic, walking in the word. And um, tonight I'm going to just take a little diversion from that particular topic. And I'll be doing the topic, you can understand the word. You know, and, and I think this is a very good um, topic to be placed right here as we endeavor to go into the word of God. Praise God. What we get to understand, praise God, brothers and sisters, is that many people do not read the Bible or many people do not study or apply the Bible. And, and, and I've seen that um, in many places. I've been to many, spoken to many uh, saints and, and, and they, they, they tell you that they, the truth is they don't spend as much time as they should in the Word. And I wonder a lot of times why this particular statement is true. Why is it true that many people do not read the Bible? Why is it that people do not study or try to apply the Bible? So I did my own little uh, research and interview with few people and few of the, two of the things that came up the most to me was this. One, many people do not know how to really study the Bible or know how really to read the Bible. And a lot of people do not know where to, be, where to begin or how to go about the process of uh, actually studying the Word of God. Praise God. So my endeavor tonight is that I'm going to encourage us as saints that as we continue uh, in the Bible study sessions that Bishop is doing, walking in the Word, I'm telling that you, apart from the fact that you can walk in the Word, amen, it's very important that we understand the Word. And I'm saying that you can understand the Word of God. Praise God. Now, praise God. As I said before, many people do not know, amen, how to study the Bible. They don't know where to begin or how to uh, go about the process of studying the Bible. Praise God. And so today we're going to look at two basic things. Our approach is to really take into consideration two main things. That is our aim tonight. One, we're going to define what is Bible study. What exactly is Bible study? When I tell you that you need to go study the Bible, what exactly am I saying that you should do? And we're going to consider eight basic things that we can take into consideration when we read or we study the Bible. Amen. The list is not exhaustive, but at the end of the day, I believe it will create a good foundation for us to actually get into the Word and get into Scriptures. Praise God. So let us start quickly by defining first what is Bible study. Now, I give a basic definition for what is Bible study. And we're going to bring that up on the screen so that we can see that. What is Bible study? Now, Bible study is a systematic approach to the Word of God. I know that I use the word systematic. It's a systematic approach to the Word of God with the view of becoming receptive and reproductive. So, we are going into the Word systematically so that at the end of the day, it can benefit our lives and we can grow and walk in the Word. Now, why do I say it is systematic? Bible study is systematic, and by that I mean it involves taking certain steps in a certain order to guarantee a certain result. I say it again. It is systematic because it involves taking certain steps and trust me, we have to do this. It takes certain steps in a certain order to guarantee a certain result. And we will realize that it is not just any step in any order if we desire good results. So if we really want to get into the Word of God, it's important to realize, as I said before, that Bible study is systematic approach to the Word of God with a view of becoming receptive and reproductive. We say one is systematic because it involves taking certain steps in a certain order to guarantee a certain result. Secondly, 
It is systematic with the view to become receptive and reproductive. So apart from the fact that we are taking scriptures in a particular order, we're trying to study it using a particular approach, a particular step. It does not just done uh, with no aim. Praise God. It is not just done with just any old aim, but it is done with the view to become receptive and to become reproductive. Praise God. Now, there are three basic steps. And I said before, these are the steps that we must follow if we're going to talk about diligent Bible study. Number one, the first step is what we call observation. When you take up your Bible to read it, what do you see? And a lot of people, they read scriptures, but they really don't spend the time to look exactly at what the scripture actually says. I'm going to come back to this. We're going to our eight steps. But we must take into consideration observation. We have to look at the scriptures, look at what the Bible actually says. Does it say render your heart or does it say rend your heart? You know, we have to take every word that we read Observe it carefully. What was happening? Was there somebody else there looking on? Was there somebody else there in the setting? Was there a young man there? Was there a crowd there? Who was there? All of these things. Proper observation. And that entails what do I actually see in the word of God. The second step is what is called interpretation. So the part from the fact that we observe what we are seeing in the scripture, we need to find out what exactly we are seeing. What does it actually mean? So when we read a scripture, um, we don't just want to just read it and observe what it says, but it's good for us to understand what it actually means. And this is very important because when we observe properly, then we will be able to interpret properly. Interpretation means what does it mean? What does the scripture actually mean? And this is very important, brethren, because when we observe and then we move down to interpret, there's a third step, which is application. How does it work? In other words, how does it apply to me? You know, Bishop is talking about walking in the word, which is very important. But before we can actually get into walking in the actual word of God, in the plain text of what the word says, it's important that Every student, every saint of the Most High God, every person who read the Bible, they observe what the Bible is actually saying. They look at what it actually means. And sometimes we move in and then we move to the third step where we apply it to our very lives or apply it where it should be applied. Praise God. Now, let me move to say that you cannot do these things in reverse. And that's why I said the order, it's systematic. It has to be in a particular order. It has to be in a particular way in order for us to get the best results. Good observation always produces an excellent or an accurate interpretation. And without an accurate interpretation, we cannot have legitimate application. Everybody get that? So good observation... So sometimes, in order for us to observe what the scripture is saying, sometimes we have to read the chapter more than once. Sometimes we have to read the story more than once because we want to observe every angle of it. When we get every angle of what is taking place, then we can jump now into interpretation. We are going now into, okay, we see where the apostle did this, or we see where the Abraham did this, and so forth. And then when we get the interpretation, then we can actually say, oh, no, I can apply this to my life. This is what I can now apply to me. Amen. But it's very important that sometimes there was, a, there was a famous theologian who actually said, after reading the verse, or after reading the, the chapter a thousand times, then I got the meaning. And I was wondering, how is it that a famous theologian could have made a statement like that? But I realized what he was doing. He was taking this approach. He was making sure that he get a full angle of what the scripture was saying. He, want, he never wanted to misinterpret anything. He never wanted to add to the verse. 
or take away from it. He wanted to ensure that he was in the book. And therefore, to be in the book, he read it many times. He read the psalm many times. He read the book many times so that he would be able to observe clearly what was taking place. Praise God. And trust me, when you get to observe what is taking place, that I said before, then you can move now into interpretation. Praise God. I, 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 I observe that, that something must have taken place between Abraham's three-day journey to, mount, to, to the mount. Something, because obviously the Bible talks about three-day journey, so it makes my mind wonder, what was Abraham thinking about on this three-day journey? But at the end of the day, he must have gotten some thought from God to the point where he said to the young men, leave his servants behind him, said, me and my son will go yonder to worship. He knew that God was going to do something. It, it, it showed me a change because he was a man who begged God for a son. Amen. And therefore, and God gave him a son. I know God is saying he must offer up this son. So when I read that story, I don't just want to read one time. I want to read it over and over because there is so much in that that I can get out of it. I realize that the, you see how God operates. Amen. He realized that even if he had killed the boy, God must have spoken to him within that three days for him to realize that even if he had killed that boy, praise God, he would have risen him from the dead. That comes out of observation. You're observing it. And guess what happens? When you observe it and you interpret what was taking place there, then you can start applying it to your life. You see the word worship there being used for the first time. First time in scripture. So it tells me a lot about what worship is. Worship is not just coming to church and lifting your hands and saying hallelujah. But worship requires giving up. Worship requires giving up what is best that you have to God. It's not just receiving from God. It's know that God is not just the blesser, but you are blessing him because he was willing to give up what was dear to him, what was most important to him. That is what I got. So now application comes into place. Praise God. Now, as we move ahead, we're going to look at eight basic things. That every child of God should consider when reading or studying the Bible. So we define what the Bible was, what Bible study was. We look at the three steps, which is observation, amen, then interpretation, and then we move down to application. And now we are saying that there are just eight basic things that every child of God should take into consideration. And as I said before, these eight steps are not exhaustive. They're not all the steps that you should know, but there's a good foundation. And if you should try in your very best that when you read the word of God going forward, that you would actually try to even make note of these things. I, I advise, I, I'm, my advice to us tonight is that we take a notebook and we write down each of these steps. And when we are going back to the word of God, we try to take these steps into consideration. Praise God. Now, the first step we must take into consideration is that when you go into the word of God, you must consider the background. The background there has a lot to do with many things. One, the background has to do with the Bible itself. A lot of us don't realize, but we are like 2,000 years removed from when the last scripture was written. When John wrote the book of Revelation about AD 96, that's about almost 2,000 years ago. Many things have changed from 2,000 years ago. Which means that when I read the word of God, I have to take into consideration the people of that time. Not only that, we're not just removed in terms of years, we are removed in terms of culture. So for example, a lot of things that we do in this side of the world, they do it differently on that side of the world. I mean, and, and, and therefore we have to take into consideration the background behind the book that we are trying to read. Praise God. I hope that we get that. So, for example, a lot of us, um, a lot of things that we do in our culture and, and, and we see it as norm, in that culture, there is a total difference to how they do it. Uh, for example, in our culture, when we, when we are going to, going to the church, we do not take off our shoes at the, big, at the 
the church door to enter the church. In their places, they take off their shoes to enter the sanctuary. Total different approach. Amen. When we saw where Jesus said to Peter, um, um, he was about to wash his feet. And Peter said, you will never wash my feet. You might, you might be thinking that Peter was being disrespectful to the Lord. But what Peter was saying, Peter always looked at Jesus to be his master. And therefore, if he was the master and the master teacher, then if Jesus was supposed to wash his feet, when Jesus was saying to him that I, Jesus, have now become your servant. Now, what, how we know that? Based on the culture. When you came off the road in those days, it's not like today. The roads were dusty. They were, they, were, they were messy. And therefore, as you entered somebody's house, what first thing would have happened is that the servant would have come and he would have washed your feet. So when Jesus said he was about to wash the disciples' feet, and the Bible said he girded himself and, and, and he put a basin, Peter wasn't trying to be disrespectful. Peter was probably saying, what are you doing? This is not the job of a rabbi. This is the job of a servant. Now, when we get the context behind the background that we understand what Jesus was trying to teach. Jesus was trying to say, look, if you're going to be servant, you're going to be leader of all, you're going to be servant of all. The Bible said the greatest among you is the servant of everybody. Bishop, the term bishop actually means chief servant. So while this bishop daily sits there in his position, the truth is he's the chief servant of all of us because under God, he's set there to serve us. And that's a role of humility. And Jesus, I love the fact that Jesus brought out the principle of servant leadership. So we have to consider the background behind what was taking place in the scripture. What was happening in the time. Amen. So to approach a study of any one of the books of the Bible, we don't know it's something of its purpose or its principle. Theme would be like reading a newspaper. We don't know anything about its date or its place of printing. Can you imagine if you take up a newspaper of 2000, of um, 2000 and, what was the last election? 2007, I remember 2007 election, that's the one I remembered. And you see election time, and you see a date on it, and you use that date to say that is the date of election now, because you did not take into consideration what was taken. Better yet, suppose you take up a newspaper from the 1800s, and they mention the name of a president, and you're reading that, and you don't take into consideration the date or the place at the time of printing you're going to miss a lot of things you're going you're going to be confused because you'll be trying to 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 the link what you're reading with what is happening now but when you read it when it is context you realize that oh this is history and therefore based on history you can learn from it in a similar way when we take up the word of god we have to take into consideration the culture we have to take into consideration the people and this is very very important Praise God. The second thing that we have to take into consideration is that we must become acquainted, and I say with the author, but I wanted to say more with the writer. Because the truth of the matter is the Bible was really authored by one person. Bishop Daly uh, communicated that to us, that it was really one author of the Bible. And God is the ultimate author. Every scripture the Bible says is given by inspiration of God. God inspired the whole Bible. It speaks to God's breath. God breathed out the word of God. And therefore, he is the person who authors the entire book. That is why from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, we can have one story going all through scriptures, even though there were many writers. But guess what happened now? When we read the scriptures, we have to become acquainted with the writer and who the writer was. Because each writer wrote under circumstances that were peculiar to him. And he uses vocabulary that would fit his occupation and education. So for example, you understand that uh, different writers would write based on how they think. So for example, if I was supposed to write today, amen, probably if I was a writer of scripture, and we know that can't be right now, right? But if I was living in the time where I was supposed to write scripture, then and, and it was being written today, probably my 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 information would come from my occupation. I would talk more about logics and software development, and I would use that logic to bring across what God has inspired me. God used my vocabulary, uses my occupation, use the way I think to express it. So the Holy Spirit helped the writer to select words from his own vocabulary. 
that conveys the message exactly as he wants it. So the Bible was inspired by God, but God used men to actually write. And, and, and I made this point that you must become acquainted with the writer because the writer has a lot to do with how the message was written. Let's just move to the other slide. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. David, what we know about David, David was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. He spent days uh, taking care of sheep. He knew what it was like to take care of sheep and to keep away uh, the, the lion and the bear and so on and so forth. And therefore, in David's writing, he could have written like Psalms 23, that the Lord is my shepherd. What was he doing? He was using his occupation. He was using what he was used to to convey to, to us how the Lord operates. Because in his mind, he knew himself as a shepherd, how he dealt with his sheep. And therefore, he looked at his very life and he knew that no bear could have come and taken a sheep from him. Not at all. He would have fought for that particular sheep. In a similar way, he used his own unique vocabulary um, to, to bring across what he wanted to express about God. So he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He make me to lie down in, because he was talking about his own examples you now. He take me to lie down in green pastures. He lead me beside the, what, the still waters. He restored my soul. He was talking about all the things that he would do as a shepherd to take care of his sheep. Look at Luke, for example. Luke was a physician. And by the way, Luke was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Even though we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke was not a disciple in the sense that one of the 12 disciples. Luke got saved under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He was Paul's personal physician on his missionary journeys. But when Luke wrote the book of Luke, notice how Luke wrote. Luke was the only one who, when you talk about the um, the woman with the issue of blood and how he described it. He described it from, not from a layman's perspective, but he described it from the way a doctor would have done it. And he said, none could heal a woman with the issue of blood. And he knew that because he was a physician at the time. And only Luke notes the Lord touched the ears of the high priest servant and healed him. Only Luke epistle brought that across. Because Luke was coming from his background as a physician. He wanted them to understand from his perspective. And you have to take these things into consideration. When we look at when the writers write, look at their occupation, look at their vocabulary. And this is why God probably used Paul to write most of the New Testament because of his vocabulary. He was like a scholarly man. Praise God. And as I said, Paul, Paul wrote 13 of the New Testament books. Who was Paul? He was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. The Bible said he taught at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee. He was a former persecutor, persecutor of the church. This was Paul. Now, now you understand why God could have used him to write about some stuff as it relates to types and shadows, and it relates to the Old Testament. And that's why it's even debated who wrote the book of Hebrews, because the man was so scholarly as it relates to Jewish knowledge that it's still a debate about who the writer of the book of Hebrew is. The, right, the reason why they, they probably say it's not Paul, because most of the Greek words that were used in Hebrew are unique to the book of Hebrew. And Paul have a way of addressing his epistles. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, so on and so forth, which we do not find in the book of Hebrew. But the type of writing and the way it was expressed and the, the knowledge of the Old Testament and the knowledge of the prophets would have given a, a, a good view that it's probably him who wrote it. We don't know. But at the end of the day, God could have used Paul to bring across use his vocabulary to express to us the prophets and the great debt we owe because of the mercy God had shown to him. He knew where he was. He knew what he did. He knew his stance. He knew how knowledgeable he was. And therefore, when God saved him and brought him to the Arabian desert and brought him back to Antioch, he could have taught the people. No wonder Paul was so upset with the Galatian church when they begin to, to, to teach back the law because he understood the thing to the T and therefore God could have used him to express to these churches. Amen. Another thing, apart from the fact that we need to uh, become acquainted with the writer, we need to ensure that we identify who the speaker is. 
Everybody get that? So if you want to understand the Bible, you need to, whatever time you take up your Bible to read it, try to look into the script and say who actually is speaking. Amen. Now, it's important to understand that the speaker may not be the same as the writer. There are many times where the person who is speaking is not necessarily the person who actually is writing. So, for example, Matthew records the words of Jesus. He records the words of Satan. He records the words of the angry mob. He records the words of the Pharisees among many other people. So, when we look in the book of Matthew and we're going to read a particular verse, always go back to who was actually speaking. Was it Jesus who was speaking these words? Was it the devil that was speaking these words? And these are very important, you know. Very, very, very important. Because you, you, you people will take words of somebody else and therefore, and, 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 and something that was not necessarily applicable because, not, because the Bible records it means that everything that the Bible records you should do. You have to find out who was talking, what was being said, Amen. Luke assembled an account of Christ's life based on eyewitness account. So guess what now? All through the book of Luke, Luke only got his information based on people that he interviewed. So he went around and the, 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 the truth about it is that Luke was very good at, at documenting information. As a matter of fact, he was one of the better of the writers of the New Testament. If you look through the book of Luke, it was systematic. It, was, it had, a, a, it had a, a, a thing to it. It had a flow to it. It had an approach to it. And he wrote to his friend um, Theophilus about certain things. But not because it was written by Luke. There's nothing in there that says Luke was talking. So we have to identify who the speaker was. And the speaker is not necessarily the writer. So all through the book of Luke, there's nothing in the book of Luke where Luke said because Luke probably was not, well, Luke was not there. As I said before, Luke had saved under the Apostle Paul's ministry, which was way after the fact. Praise God. Another thing we have to take into consideration, number four, is that we have to identify the purpose of the book. Now, every time you read a particular book of the Bible, the first thing you have to take into consideration, what was the purpose of this book being written? You see, that is very good, you know. And what it does, as we said before, it allows you to put things in their right context. It allows you to put, apply it properly. And I'm going to show you something as we go along. But let me just take this one uh, as we go. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, for example, the book of Ecclesiastes was written by uh, Solomon. The preacher said he was going to search for something that was good for a man. That was the purpose of the book. And therefore, when we look through the book, we see what he was doing. In chapter 1, uh, we, we realize that he tells how to search proceeds. He tells of much folly. So as he tells about how he's going to search, he tells of much folly that will exist. A lot of things that he has experienced in his life, he said these things are just folly. The second thing, using man wisdom, he pursued courses that would not result in good end for man. So look at some things that, that, that were there that existed and said, well, at the end of the day, these things, they seem good, you know. I mean, it seemed good. He said, consider all of these things under the sun. And at the end of the day, it really not good for you. So his search was, what exactly is good for man? And guess what was his conclusion? That happiness does not lie in man's pursuit of what he thinks is good. But guess what happiness lies? In fearing God and keeping his commandments. We can only get that when we understand the purpose of writing the book. I told you a while ago about the apostle, about Luke. You can find the purpose of Luke in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. When he wrote the, the, the second uh, treaty to his friend Theophilus. He says, He shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me. That's him say, right? He shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, a lot of us don't even realize that within that one verse, 
what Luke was doing was giving the outline to how he was about to write the book. Check it out. From about chapter 1 to about chapter 7, the book is centered around Jerusalem. Then what happened? There came great uh, persecution and they were forced to go to Judea and then Samaria, which is the second part of the book. And then by the time we reach Acts chapter 13, we talk about Paul's missionary journey, which is to the uttermost parts of the earth. So right there, we see the key to understanding the book, the purpose of the book. He was talking about the Holy Ghost, the work of the Holy Ghost, first at Jerusalem, then at Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Praise God. We see an example in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. Now, here it is that John was writing. He said, write these things. The things which thou hast seen. The things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. John used the same approach like Luke. Because he showed right there the segment of the book of Revelation. The things which thou hast seen. What did John see? In Revelation chapter 1, he saw the glorified Christ. He saw Christ in a glorified manner. The things which are, he presented the seven churches that existed. The seven churches that were there in Asia Minor. And the things which shall be hereafter is from chapter 4, where he presents things that were to come in the future. But guess what? We can only pick that up when we pick out what the purpose of the book is sometimes the purpose is at the front of the book sometimes the purpose is at the end of the book but it doesn't matter our key is that when we are reading any book of the bible we want to understand what was the purpose of this writer who was he writing to what was the what was the reason why he wrote this and guess what when we get that information you'll be surprised at how much it will help you to read the scriptures in its rightful place Next thing we have to consider, praise God, we have to consider places, addresses. In what city did the addressees live? So when, 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 and I always tell persons who read the Bible, it's good to get an idea of where, uh, of how, uh, the places where Jesus went. Because you'll be surprised that all of the Gospels, amen, took place in one little area. What were the occupations that were common there? These are the things that take into... So when you're reading the Bible, you're not just reading for reading purposes. You know. You're reading it because you want to have an understanding of what was taking place. And you see these things? These things help to build you as a person who reads the Bible. It helps to give you a view. The other day I was doing a, a review or a... What we call it now? I was trying to, to... There was a debate between two gentlemen. And they were debating on the role of women in the church and so on and so forth. And at the end of the debate, I went on to explain that when you read the scriptures, you have to take into consideration what is called the grammatical historical context. Very important. Grammatical means the words, so on and so forth. Historical means the history. What was, what was the reason why Corinth was so corrupt? You ever wonder? A lot had to do with where Corinth was even located. It was located in a, in a little, like a little land between. It was on a port area where ships would come in. So you know what happened? A lot of people would have passed through. Rich people would have passed through. Thinking about all the, the rich men who went on their cruises and they came in and they would have stopped at Corinth. Now you know what I mean? It was a port city, which means that rich passed through, um, prostitutes passed through, everybody passed through this particular area. And therefore, when Paul wrote to the church, he had these things in mind as he took into consideration uh, writing to them. Because he knew that within that particular city, there was a lot of corruption that were taking place. And guess what? It was infiltrating the church. 
how we get that based on studying and understanding the the, 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 the the area the occupations that exist why do you think paul wrote to the church uh and telling them that look here you, the women need to be silent in the church and so on you might say it does him just say it like that no you have to understand what's taking place in ephesus at the time you had the temple of Diana, and the women were playing the majority role they were used to being in charge they were used to talking all the time and paul had to say look here man in the church of god it's a little different but you have to study the context, the occupation, the, what was taking place. What was the governing authority in the city? Amen. So, for example, when you read the, the Old Testament and you, and you see them under um, the Babylonian, the Babylons, or Nebuchadnezzar, that was Babylonian rule. And therefore, Babylon had a system with how they rule. As opposed to the Medo Persians, they had a different system with how they rule. Let me give you an example. Under the Babylonian system, amen, under the Babylonian system, the king had all authority. He could have decided who dead, who live, who go in prison, all of these things. So the king was higher than the law. You see, by the time we read the story of Daniel in the lions then, he was under what is called the Medo-Persian Empire. Now there's a difference with the Medo-Persian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. So the Babylons came first and then eventually the Medo-Persians came and they took over from the Babylonians. Eh? But guess what there was the difference between the Medo-Persians and the Babylonians? Under the Babylonians, under Nebuchadnezzar and all his successive kings, the king had all authority. Under the Medo-Persian Empire, it was a little different. The law was higher than the king. So whatever the king sealed with his signet became law and he cannot change it at all. So if you understand the governing authority. So when they, when they couldn't find nothing against Daniel but against his God, that's what the scripture says, they realized that this was a man that prayed often. And what did they do? Praise God. What did they do? They ensured that they went to the king and they set up something and said nobody is supposed to pray to any other God but the God that, that you set up Darius and Darius didn't realize that it was against his very friend Daniel because the truth is if you look at the scripture careful a lot of times we preach it and we say boy the king show him in the lines then the king had no choice look at the scripture carefully again as I was say we're talking about observation the king was worried as a matter of fact the first morning the king go out and call for his friend Daniel and he was so happy when he saw that Daniel was still alive but guess what happened Based on the laws of the Medes and the Persians, what had taken place is that he had sealed it in his segment that any person who prayed to any other God over this period of time would have been thrown into the lion's den. When he realized that, and he came to him and said, Daniel is praying to another God, and trust me, Daniel was faithful, and Daniel continued to pray. And Daniel continued to pray, irrespective of the fact that the law changed. Which means that if there's a law which goes contrary to your God, that is the only time where you are, for, you are permitted to say, Look here, man, I understand that this is the law, but guess what? the word of God is takes full preeminence in my life. So even though Daniel was wise to follow the rules that existed, the rule that came about was against his God. And therefore, he continued to pray. But guess what? We learn about something about the, 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 the governing authority that existed. Then after them, we had the Grecians. And then from the Grecians, we had the Romans. So we realized that when we reach the New Testament, there were a total set of people that were in power that were, that, 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 they, that were in the Old Testament. A total different set of rules. Everything has changed. And that's why when Jesus made the comment... I have to understand how these governing authorities do their thing. So, for example, when, 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 when Jesus made a comment, and look here, when you're, if somebody asks you to go with one mile, you should go with him too. A lot of us read that and we don't realize what it was saying. What Jesus was saying to them was that, how do you deal with your enemies? Who were their enemies? The governing authority, the Romans. Remember, they never wanted the Romans in authority, you know. And the Romans were saying, look here, there was a rule under the Romans that, look here, man, if... As long as I'm carrying a load and I see a Jew, that Jew would have to take that load. As long as I ask him to do it, they have to walk with me at least one mile. And Jesus, look here, man. When your enemy come to you with this particular thing, instead of walking one mile, go with him two miles. In other words, Jesus was saying, this is how you deal with people who, who, who think that they can mistreat you. 
A boy, I'm telling Jesus to make a hard statement because a lot of us would have said, Me? But God was just bringing out a principle that how we operate in this time. How did the city relate to the authority? So Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, for example. So how did the city relate to that authority? Nineveh, as I said before, was the capital city of Assyria. Now we understand why the, the, the prophet never wanted to go down there. Nineveh had nothing to do with Jews at all. It was not a Jewish set of people. They were a wicked set of people that hated the Jews. They were Assyrians. They were the enemies of God. And God was about to destroy them. But the prophet knew that if they repented, then they would have gotten it. And he never wanted to go there. Philippi was considered Roman soil. So we talk about the city of Philippi. And we read the book of Philippians. It was not, it was, it was not even Hebraic or Jewish. It was mainly Romans. These things help us to get a full understanding of when we understand who we are addressing. Let's move to the next point. Point number six. Our sixth thing to consider. Now, this is very, very important and dear to me. No, you can't you can go back. This is very, very important and dear to me. Point number six. Anytime you read scriptures, always consider what is the context. I'll say that again. Anytime you read the scriptures, consider what is the context. Context is the key to understanding. This is very, 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 very important. A good example is found in Jesus' statement in Luke chapter 10, verse 37. He said, go and do likewise. Now, I heard a story about a young man who was feeling sad. And he read the scripture. He read the scripture that actually said, uh, he opened his Bible and he, and, and he was like, God, what am I supposed to do? And he read the scripture which says that, uh, who was it? Judas hanged himself. Can you imagine that? He said, what? Now that scripture said, no man, Judas hanged himself. Oh right, God, what are you trying to say to me? So he closed back his Bible and he opened back his Bible and he opened it to Luke chapter 10 verse 37. And the scripture says, go and do likewise. Now you can imagine <laughs> if this young man took that particular thing by just opening the Bible and locking it and closing the Bible and locking it and broke up these two verses and he went and he hung himself. My God, that would have been a sad story. But when we read scriptures, we have to take into consideration what the context of this particular word or this, or this particular phrase or this particular word, whatever the case is, is taking place. So by looking at the scripture in Luke chapter 10 verse 37, it says by reading the surrounding verses, we realize Jesus meant for us to love our neighbor by being merciful to him when we see him in need. So if we read the scriptures above it, he was talking about how you must treat your neighbor and so on and so forth. And guess what? He, talk, he brought out a story about the good Samaritan and so on and so forth. And guess what? At the end of telling all of that story, he was telling his disciples to go and do likewise. In other words, you must go and love your neighbor. Our understanding of neighbor is found in Jesus' answer to the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor? Because it was the first question asked, who is your neighbor then? And who is your neighbor based on the stories? All who are in need. So when we read that, that phrase, go and do likewise, we don't know taking that phrase out of its context. What we're doing, we're realizing that Jesus, who was the person who was talking, was actually saying that we must treat our neighbor a particular way, treat them with love, persons who are in need. And notice we use the term neighbor. And who is your neighbor? Anybody who is in need. Anybody who you see at church who needs help. Go and do likewise. Go and help them where you can and if you can. Praise God. So this is very, very important to me. Context is very important. Now let's just move to some basic things about context. There are three parts of a context. One, you have to take into consideration the specific statement itself. Like in this example, go and do likewise. That was the specific statement that we are reading. 
But before we can understand this statement, we have to take into consideration what is called the immediate concept, which includes verses immediately before or after. So every time you, if you want to understand what a verse is saying, brothers and sisters, what you have to do is that if you read a particular phrase and it jumps out at you, then read what was above it. Read what was being said above it. And read what is said after it. Verses after it to see what exactly, where does this fit? What was being said? And then you have what is called a remote context, which includes all that is said in the whole Bible about the thing being considered. Because sometimes we might find a particular phrase and it cannot be unique to that particular example. It has to take into consideration everything else. I brought up the example in the last Bible study about the term Sabbaton. Remember I brought that one? And I was saying that it's interesting that that scripture in Colossians, the Adventists will tell you that, that only one place they're saying that it does not refer to the seventh day Sabbath. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you could probably take a look back at that Bible study. But when we look into the full context, the remote context of that word, Sabbaton, we realize that it always refers in the New Testament to the seven-day Sabbath. So in a similar thing, we have to take the specific statement itself, the immediate context, which is probably the chapter, or sometimes, the, yeah, just the chapter, or sometimes if we don't even get the full understanding there, we have to take into consideration the entire book. Again, our next example, I've heard people say, and, I, and I've used this example before, in the scripture in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, where Paul was talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And people say, you see it? The Bible did say, all do not speak with tongues. But if you read the verses above it, you realize what Paul was talking about. Paul was talking about spiritual gifts. And he did mention that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you to be what? Ignorant. So the context of the whole of what he was dealing with from our chapter 12 going forward was about spiritual gifts. In chapter 13, he wanted the, 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 the church in Corinth to understand that, look here, even though you have spiritual gifts in operation, praise God, at the end of the day, spiritual gifts it won't profit you anything if you are not living for God as you should. Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels? And note he was talking about the gifts before. And have not charity, you're going to profit you nothing. You're just a sounding brass or a thing. So he, he put the thing in its prideful context. So we, when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13, he was taking that scripture in the context of what he was talking about, which was spiritual gifts. And he was trying to tell the church that, look, you have spiritual gifts. And they were, and, and they were very, trust me, even though the church was corrupt, Amen. And, and, and it shows a lot of things from that, you know. Even though the church was very corrupt and the church was not doing what it should do, they were still operating in the gifts. And Paul had to say, look here, you're operating in the gifts, yes? But if you don't have these particular things, at the end of the day, it's not going to profit you anything. So you can, you, you, you can preach or teach or sing or whatever you can do. If at the end of the day, you're not living according to what the word of God says. And that's what Paul was saying in basic sense. You can be powerful and not spiritual because you can go up there and you can preach i've seen preachers who have mastered the art of getting people flat but their lifestyle is not where it should be so at the end of the day what is important for you to live god better yet it's good to have the good balance but all of these things take into context of where we want to go praise god and we move to the the other slide now look at this example and I, and I use this one. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, I've asked, I've seen where people have said, look here, this is all you need to do to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. Because this was Paul's and Silas gave address to the Philippian jailer when he asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul responded and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But that word believe is a loaded word. And obviously, must be interpreted in the light of all of Acts and all of Scripture. And better yet, you can even use the immediate context to see what Paul was talking about. Because if you move to the next slide, we'll realize what took place after that. The Scripture said, the context revealed that they taught him the word of the Lord. 
he washed their stripes and was baptized immediately along with his family. So if it was a case where he only needed to believe, why did Paul baptize him? Acts chapter verse 24 says, And he brought them up into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly with all his souls, having believed in God. So believed there is a loaded word. It clearly indicates that believing God involves hearing the truth and doing what the word of God says. So it's, it's not just a mental thing, but belief requires action. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's what the scripture says, right? So at the end of the day, when the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household, we, can't just, we have to read it in its context so that we can understand what is taking place there. We move to the other um, principle. Look carefully at the words. And this can, be, this can fall in a sense under context, but I just remo remove it a little bit so we can understand. Look carefully carefully at the words now you will realize that words used in many passages but we understood in order to fully grasp the meaning you have to look at the word in every passage uh, and understand what it's saying so that you can fully grasp the meaning of what the passage is saying so paul tells of a man who was caught up in the yacht the third heavens now i mean first of all What the first question I would ask based on observation is that it said the third heavens. So there must be a first and a second based on what I'm seeing there. And there is. The first heaven talk about the birds, where the birds fly. That's the first heaven, where the birds are and you can see the sky and the clouds. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is where stars shine. That is where we have the, 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 the atmospheric heaven. That is where you have the... No, I'm sorry, the starry heaven, they call it, where you have like the planets and the moon and so on and so forth. So when Paul said he was caught up into the third heavens, he was talking about the heaven of heavens. He was talking about where the God actually resides. So we have to take the word itself into consideration. Look, let's look at another word to bring across this point. Look at the word death. Not everywhere where we read the death in scriptures, it actually means physical death. And I hope we can realize that. So the same word can be used, but it can have many different meanings in different passages. So for example, in Genesis chapter 24, verse 6 to 7, it's talking about physical death. Amen? So in Genesis chapter 24, and verse 67, it talking about physical death. And it was talking about um, Isaac's mom. Physical death. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, it's talking about death in sin. But in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, we see death to sin. So all of these examples uses the same word death, but all of the death there talk about a different context and that is why we have to look carefully at what the word is let's just look at our next example again remember we got a, bit, a, a clear clear one for you to get it look at the word faith in matthew chapter 8 verse 10 jesus described a centurion action by saying assuredly and this is not the king james i say to you i have not found such great faith not even in israel now faith there speaks to believe the man believed what God was saying to him. That's faith in Matthew chapter 8 verse 10. But in Jude chapter 3, Jude used the same word faith. He said he must earnestly contend for the faith. That word faith there is not talking about believe. But it's talking about a system of Christian truth. Which should be believed. It's talking about the standard. Talking about what the apostles stand for. So one faith they're talking about. Uh, uh, um, you know like regular faith. Like you, you believe God. Your faith has a, have a mustard seed. So on and so forth. That type of faith in Matthew chapter 8 verse 10. But in Jude chapter 3. It's talking about the Christian conduct. Talking about what the apostles died for. The doctrine. The teaching. The system of truth. Of beliefs. Of the apostles. And I'm saying must earnestly contend for the faith. So here we see the word faith being used in two different verses, but they have two different meanings. 
So therefore, if we want to understand scriptures, it's important that we take into consideration the word. Look at the word. Sometimes, if you need, uh, if you need to get to, uh, I encourage my students to get a, uh, a Bible concordance, you know, and, and get certain things so you can actually see the meaning of what that word is. You know, a Bible dictionary. Sometimes so you can see the different meanings, what the word could actually mean. Don't, don't think that extra biblical things. And God has inspired men. Uh, the Bible was not originally written in English. And I said it the other day. It was written originally in Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. Therefore, when the translators were trying to bring it to English, they used the best words that they possibly could find. And therefore, what we have to do is that we have to sometimes look back to say, okay, this was the Greek word that was used there. That Greek word can mean this. That Greek word can mean this. And the context will help us to decide what exactly was happening in there. Praise God. Well, let's move to the last point. Do not read into a passage a meaning that is not there. And this is very important. Now, you see, the process of drawing out of a text, and I don't want to go theological, but the process of drawing out of a text, its intended meaning is called exegesis. And this is very important. If you don't learn anything else, try the swollen and the, the fact that you should read, you should not try to read a passage into a passage more than what is actually there. What you want to do is exegesis, which is actually to pull out what the writers in the Old Testament were actually saying. If you do it any other way, it's what we call eisegesis, where we put into the passage something that was not there. Let's give you a good example, one that is easy for us to read, or easy for us to understand. Look at the scripture. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Verse 11 says, And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So, one of the things I learned as a young boy, uh, and I've, I've heard it said, many times by many teachers even in school that there were three wise men and the three wise men each wise man brought a gift one brought gold one brought frankincense and one brought myrrh but let's just look back at the verse again it says no after jesus was born in bethlehem of judea in the days of herod the king behold what you see three there behold wise men from the east came to jerusalem the reason why they associate three with the wise men was because of the gifts that were being offered but guess what happened when you do something like that and this is a simple example but trust me we see a lot people like a lot of errors in by doing stuff like this because they did not observe the scripture carefully the scripture says behold wise men from the east came to jerusalem and they brought gifts now look at this this might be a simple example which has no theological consequences. But trust me, there are other verses where people might insert just one little thing. Give a good example. The scripture says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If you look in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, you see, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. It changed it by inserting one word. Into that particular verse, it switched the context all together. There's another scripture in Colossians where the Bible said, All things were made by him. And the, 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 the Joel is putting put in, put in the one word, other. Why they put in other is based on their theological stance. They have inserted something into the verse because they wanted to fit what they believe. What they believe? They believe that God, Jehovah God, created Jesus. And then Jesus created all other things. But that's not what the scripture says. The Bible said all things were made by him. If all things were made by Jesus, it makes Jesus Jehovah God. And therefore, in order to fit their theology, they insert one other word. 
And that is why it's very important. I remember one time they came to my house and when they were reading that scripture in Colossians and every time they mentioned the word other, I listened and I said, can I read it from my Bible, please? And I said, okay. And I read it. I said, where do you get the word other from in that particular verse? And they are saying, um, but they have the right. I said, no, every Greek scholar looks at this particular verse and there's no no other interpretation but yours where have you gotten the word other you know they didn't come back to my house you have to be careful and be sure that at the end of the day you do not insert into the verse more than his, that is actually there so in order for us to not do that we have to look at what does the text say did the text actually say three wise men or did the text say wise men it says wise men and when we read the scripture what am i assuming this text says that it does not say so sometimes because we already have some presuppositions in our head about what we think the verse is actually saying we have to remove that when we go into scripture and say okay what do i i know i used to hear it this way but did the verse actually say that and this will bring clarity and help us to get where we should be as it relates to interpreting scriptures we want to walk in the word we want to ensure that we are in the word as we should but in order for us to do that we have to be ensure that we look at what the verse actually says in closing as i said brothers and sisters you can understand the word you can understand the book praise god you can understand what the bible is saying you don't have to to, it's not nothing hard. I said, this is not an exhaustive list. But I want us to, in our spare time, to try to at least apply some of these things that we have learned tonight. We'll define what Bible study is. We said that Bible study is a systematic approach to scriptures so that we can be reproductive. Amen. That we can grow in the word. And we say it's systematic because it takes into consideration that we must look at what the scripture is saying, what we call observation. So we say, what does it say? Then we say, apart from saying, what does it say? What does it mean? I would say that is interpretation. So we'll get at what the scripture is saying and what does it mean? Then we move down to uh, application. How does it apply to me? How does it apply to others? Amen. And we'll look at eight basic things that we should consider when we're reading or studying the Bible. I pray God that we don't just rush through scriptures anymore. But when we look at the scriptures, we will take our times and we will read what Paul was saying to, Paul, to, to the church at Ephesus and what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth and what Paul was saying here. Take our time and we look at eight things that we should do. Number one, let's recap them. We said we must consider the background. Number two, praise God, we did say that we are supposed to become acquainted with what the, what the writer, acquainted with the writer. So sometimes, I would say, become acquainted with the writer, take into consideration his occupations and the words that he would actually use. Thirdly, we must identify who the speaker was. The speaker is not always the writer. Look at who was actually speaking. So we read a story, and this comes as a place to the narrative examples. Uh, who was actually speaking? Was it Jesus speaking? Was it God speaking? Was it the devil speaking? Was it the prophet speaking? So on and so forth. We must identify the purpose of the book. Why did Paul write this book? Why did Paul write the letter of Philemon? What was happening in that particular story that Paul had to write that letter uh, to, to, to Philemon and so on? And what was taking place there? Amen. Identify the addressee as in ways to what is the background? What are the cities mentioned? What was the culture? What was the occupation in that city? What was the main things that were taking place in that city? Why Paul had to write or the writers had to write or what was the storyline? Why did they say it come down from Jerusalem to Judea? Was it that Jerusalem was on high and Judea was on low? All of these things we have to take into consideration. We said very important, number six, what is the context? And I said I, I, I want you to highlight this one context you have to take into consideration what is called the immediate context what are the words before it what are the words after it and if sometimes we don't get the answer we have to go as far as the remote context what is this in the consideration of the entire bible so every time we see the word sin how is sin addressed how is sin dealt with when we see the word worship what is worship have to do with it? is that worship is the same word all the way across what's the principle behind worship what's the principle behind this part love so on and so forth 
and, 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 and there's a thing that we call um, doing a, a word study where we look everywhere in the scripture where we see a particular word and we look at everywhere it's used and how it's used. That's context. We look carefully at what the word is. Everywhere the word love is used, it's the same love. Amen? And, 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 and if you look in the Greek, the Greek has about four different words for love. So you have agape, you have starge, you have euros, and so on and so forth. So everywhere where the scripture uses love, is it talking about agape love? Is it talking about starge love? Is it talking about filial love? All of these things. Are Philadelphia, are filio, that's the word. Filial love. And do not read into a passage a meaning that is not there. Very, very important. Which means you can observe very carefully. You can take your time. You can look at what are the presuppositions that you have come to the scripture with. And you're going to ensure at the end of the day that you do not ICG scriptures, but you exegete scriptures. You pull out, the, out of the scriptures what is supposed to be there. I pray God that we will, as we go forward in the Bible studies that Bishop is doing with us, that we will, in the back of our mind, take some of these things into consideration. I know it was a handful in a sense, but trust, trust me, what we have done was scrape the surface. There's a course that we do in Bible school that is called Biblical Hermeneutics, where we really go in more in-depth as it relates to these things. That cannot be covered in a one-hour session. But however, it's important that if, if we don't go to Bible school, there are some basic things that we can do as children of God. Try to invest in little simple things. And if you don't know what they are, you can find uh, Bible teachers like probably Bishop Daly, probably myself, ask what are the books that we need to buy. Uh, Bishop Marlon Bailey, uh, uh, Mr. Marlon Bailey, what are the books that we need to buy, the, 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 the Bible dictionary, the so on and so forth that we need to get. And these people will guide you in terms of how you should, how you study and how you read the word. But I hope you make note of each of these points. And going forward, that you will try to apply them in your reading. I pray God that we will continue to grow and live and walk in the word of God. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. I will pray as I close. Great God, we exalt you tonight. We magnify your name. We thank you, God, for your word, which is spirit, which is life. We thank you, God, that you have uh, provided for us, God, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that we might rightly divide your word of truth. You said in your words that we must study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing your word of truth. God, we want to ensure that even the lessons that our bishop is teaching us in this season that we can rightly, God, divide your word and that we can walk as we should in the word of God. God, we want to please you. And we know, God, at the end of the day, we want, God, when your trump is sound, that we will be caught up to meet you. God, we don't want to miss the mark. We don't want to drift. God, but we want to be head on. We want to ensure that our lives mirrored up and matches up and it's living according to what your word says. Help us, God. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge. Give us understanding. Help us, God, to, to be in your book. And help us, Lord Jesus, to even these little simple principles that we have learned tonight. Help us, Lord Jesus, to never read uh, our scriptures necessarily out of context. And where we have gone wrong, God, remove it out of our minds that we might go back to the word of God and apply what it should be and how it should be. I pray, God, for every saint that will take part in this Bible study tonight and those who will watch it from after this session God. I pray, God, that you'll help them, God, that they will not just be hearers of the word, but they will be doers of the word, and that they will apply these simple principles. They will systematically observe what the word of God says. They will look at the word. They will rightly interpret what the word of God says, and they can interpret what the word of God says in their very lives. Thank you, Jesus, for your spirit, which is, thank you, Lord God, for your Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord God, for your presence. And as we are about to go from now, God, I pray that you'll guide and protect every saint. Cover them under your blood. Even in this season, persons, God, protect them, God, even from this disease that is on the, in the land right now. God, them, you'll cover your saints. Cover them with your blood and help them, Lord Jesus, that they will be safe and sound. But above all else, God, at the end of the day, that we will be ready. Because that's the most important thing in this life. That our souls will be ready, waiting to meet you. Thank you, God, for your presence one more time. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word of God, which is spirit and is life. Thank you, Jesus, in this hour. In Jesus' name I pray right now. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. God bless you in Jesus' name.